and I have to say that's just about the total, totality of my Spanish, so I apologize. Um, thank you. It's great to be here at Elastics World. Uh, I was here last year. I was at Elastics World last year in Quito, and it was a wonderful experience, and a great opportunity to meet a whole different segment of the uh, the Astros using community in the form of the Elastics community, which is. Well, been growing successfully for the last several years, and I just love seeing this giant crowd here in front of me. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Asterisk 10 and what's beyond Asterisk 10, and I'm going to uh, hopefully do this in a way that's interesting and entertaining. We'll have a number of demos. Uh, I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Mr. Malcolm Davenport, down here. Malcolm will uh, be assisting with the demo that we'll be doing here in a few moments. So. Uh, I guess just to take a brief moment for anybody who's come to Elastics but hasn't actually dug in and figured out uh, anything about Asterisk, which lives sort of under the covers in Elastics, what Asterisk is and what it does. So to sort of explain it, and uh, let me actually change the way these slides are presented so that you can see them. communications engine. That means it's the plumbing, the underlying technology, which takes care of uh, a lot of the details that, uh, that make Elastics and make other communications applications work. And we'll go into a little bit more on that in a moment. It's also an open source project. Uh, there's over 2 million downloads of Astros every year worldwide. There are over a million production servers in use throughout the world. And there's about 80,000 members of the uh, Astros community. And that's just people who have actually registered and signed up. We know of you know, tens of thousands more who are sort of casual users of Astros. Uh, Astros is not a new project. We've been around since 1999. So we're 12 years old now. And we are probably the, uh, the undisputed uh, kings of open source telepathy in terms of the engine layer of everything. So what does Astros do? Well, it provides the plumbing. The uh, protocol implementations, so things like SIP and EEX and H323, and of course the ISDN stack as well. It handles media I.O., so uh, taking care of recording audio, playing back audio, and managing and manipulating audio. It takes care of media management, so the ability to transcode or convert from one audio format to another or one video format to another. Uh, it takes care of session management, so all the details of setting up a call, maintaining that call, and at the proper time tearing that call down. It also acts as the intermediary, providing services where you've got perhaps an old PDX on one side and you've got a web service on the other. So it's really acting as the middleman in a lot of cases. So what are some of the applications that are built into Asterisk? Well, we have call routing, which is sort of the core function of Asterisk, routing the call from one extension to another and that's handled through our dial plan or through things that attach to the dial plan. We have voicemail, which is, of course, the recording and playback of voice messages. Conference version, call queuing, automated attendance, directory, call parking. All of these are low-level components that have been built into, or pardon me, high-level components that have been built into Asterisk that are then used or wrapped up in Elastics and other similar products. So how do you use Asterisk? Well, there's a couple of different ways. You could use it as an application unto itself, a standalone. And in that case, you would be building a hand, uh, a one-off implementation where you actually install Asterisk on a Linux server. You configured it by making use of configuration files and by writing dial plan scripts. And then also, uh, you would end up building a PBX, a point gateway, IVR, ACD, etc. You can also use it, however, as a toolkit or an engine means that it becomes the underlying technology which is uh, used to provide telephony services. In this case, you program it by way of things like the AGI interface or the AI, uh, Asterisk Manager interface. You wrap it up around uh, or wrap around it other technologies, things like PHP and uh, MySQL and some of the other components that make up things like Elastics. And you wind up using it to build, among other things, custom applications and solutions on one hand or communications products. So people have taken asterisk, wrapped it into elastics, and then people have taken elastics and installed that on hardware, and they go around and sell that. So 
how do asterisk and elastics work together? Well, again, asterisk really acts as the plumbing, the underlying engine. So it's the void, the PSD and connectivity components, the session or call management, basic applications, all of those low-level applications that I mentioned a moment ago. And elastics, on the other hand, is the higher level. It's really the executive. It's the uh, operational or business logic layer. So it handles how calls are actually treated in the system. It sets what happens and what goes on. It uh, configures the PDX logic. Uh, the PDX logic, how calls are routed from one station to another. And it sets up business rules and policies so that uh, when you need to implement things like the security that you uh, saw in the last presentation, you have the ability to do that from within the elastics layer of things. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about Asterisk 10 primarily, but I do want to take a moment to go back and talk a little bit about some of the things that came out in Asterisk 1.8, which came out a year ago. Uh, and is about to make its way, I believe it's right now in the, uh, the development version, or the, uh, the sort of test version of Elastics. So, some of the newest things that wound up in there, it was released at Astrocon in 2010, is our first long-term support, or LTS release, since 1.4, so about five years now. That comes with four years of support, of which we've been through about one of them, and then one additional year of uh, bug fixes for security. So some of the features that you'll find in there, secure calling with SIP, so we added SRTP, uh, adding that on top of uh, TLS, which is used for signaling security, so you're now actually able to set up and maintain secure calls using asterisk. We've also added in an event, uh, security event framework, which uh, is designed really to catch people who are trying to do abuse. Now in the last presentation you saw a very holistic uh, view of what security should be for VoIP applications. And this is one component of that. It's not ever going to be the end-all, be-all, or the only means of securing an asterisk or elastic system. Um, as of 1.8, that really was just a framework. As of 1.10, there's actually been some uh, security uh, um, events that have been added into it. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. We've also added IPv6 support. So as most of you probably know, the world is rapidly running out of IPv4 addresses. And so in order to uh, sort of be ahead of the game on that, we IPv6 enabled the SIP channel. Uh, that's only one of several interfaces within Asterisk, and uh, we're working to uh, enable others as we go forward. And you'll actually see that as we go through the uh, 1.10 feature, or pardon me, the 10.0 features. So um, some of the other things that have shown up in Asterisk 1.8, calendar integration, so you're able to tie Asterisk in with a iCal, CalDAV, or Exchange calendar, and you're actually able to use that from your dial plan to make routing decisions. So you can check a calendar and see, do you have a meeting right now? If you have a meeting, instead of ringing your phone, it would perhaps route to your, uh, your voicemail directly. Or if you know that you're going to be out of the office and you set a calendar event for that, it could route directly to your mobile device. Uh, channel event logging is another new feature, and that is really highly detailed call history records. Uh, something that people ask for constantly is to be able to track a call as it goes from application to application to application uh, throughout the life of a particular SIP session or each session or, or ISDN session. And so we've actually added this in as a means of providing very detailed call detail records that you can use to provide uh, debugging information, historical information, uh, track usage, etc. We've also added XMPP uh, state information distribution. XMPP is the Jabber protocol, and this allows you to actually share information from one asterisk box to another. Um, in this case, the things that are most important are things like message waiting indication. And the use case for this would be you have a cluster of front-end machines, which are the machines that the users actually register to. You have one voicemail system. So when somebody leaves a voicemail message, it's actually being left on a separate system, and all of the front-end machines need to be able to check to see, hey, how many voice messages do you have? Do you have any messages waiting, et cetera? Another common use for this uh, new feature is for device state. So you're actually able to check from one machine to another, is this particular extension in use? Is this particular device on the off of talking, active, et cetera? Uh, so you're actually able to sort of scale or spread asterisk a little bit easier that way. We also added a number of new, what we call ISDN features, though all of these uh, actually apply to SIP as well. And this includes advice of charge, which tells you what the call uh, is costing you. 
and that can be uh, updated continually throughout the call, or it can be presented only at the end of the call, depending on uh, the network you're connected with. Call completion supplementary services, which if you're used to the uh, traditional world of PDXs, is frequently also called camp on, and this is the ability to wait for an extension to become available and then connect a call to it. A uh, third feature that we've added is connected party identification, which is really caller ID on steroids. It's a, it's a very uh, powerful version of caller ID that instead of just providing you with the uh, information about who you called and uh, who's on the other end of it, it actually updates both parties. And if you transfer a call, you actually get an update packet that tells you who you're connected to after that. So instead of seeing just the original call like you're actually seeing the current information. Uh, all of these, again, we're built to work with the SIP protocol as well as with the ISDN protocol. And you'll actually be able to transit data back and forth between those two networks. So a wrap-up of uh, remaining asterisk 1.8 features. We added Google Voice, Google Chat, and Google Talk. So you're actually able to place calls to and from Google Voice users and to use Google as a trunk sometimes. Uh, Google has never really objected to us making use of Google Voice from within Asterisk, but on the other hand, they don't publish the standards. It's not a published specification that you use to communicate with it. And uh, on occasion, they make changes to their protocol without telling anybody up front. So sometimes it works great, and sometimes you have to wait a few days until the developers can catch up with Google. Uh, one last feature we added last year, pitch shift. So if you really want to, you can use pitch shift for all kinds of things. <laughs> Now, on to Asterisk 10. So, uh, first people say, so what is going on with Asterisk 10? Last year you had Asterisk 1.8. Why is it now Asterisk 10? Well, Asterisk 1.10 sounded strange to people. A lot of people out in the, uh, the non-open source world especially said, wouldn't 1.10 really be 2.0? We had to say, no, 2.0 would be well, something else. And after discussing it, we had a lot of people tell us that they thought asterisk shouldn't have a 1.x name associated with it any longer. That 1.0 products are often considered to be immature, uh, to be new to market, and asterisk is 12 years old. So we thought about it, we came up with all sorts of different names and options, and we could have called it asterisk 2011 or 2000 and, uh, you know, or something else. We decided it was simply easiest just to drop the, uh, the first digit, so it became asterisk 10. When will it be released officially? Well, the plan right now is uh, to release it in the next couple of weeks. We announced it at Astrocon. Our original target was to release at Astrocon, but unlike commercial products, we don't rush things out the door. But we release it when it's tested and when it's ready. So, um, one frequent question I get is, what's the next version going to be called since we keep changing the naming scheme? And right now, the plan is to go to 11. So, asterisk 11, after that, asterisk 12, after that, asterisk 13, and so on. So, asterisk 10, we are building for the future. Um, 2011 really is, as they say in the sporting world, a rebuilding year. We decided instead of making you know, a number of splashy changes, we're going to make some very important low-level changes which set us up for a long-term success. Um, the, really, the big things that we decided to do, and I guess I should mention that Asterisk 10, because of this, is going to be a standard support release, meaning there'll be one year of uh, mainline support and then an additional year of security fixes, but it will not receive the four-year support that uh, a long-term support release gets. Um, We've decided to upgrade all of the key plumbing for the new HD, or high definition audio and video world. Uh, we've decided to create in, uh, the infrastructure inside of Asterisk that will allow not only the current Asterisk development community, but we're hoping a much larger community of users to jump in and add additional enhancements. And we spent a lot of time working on performance, stability, and interoperability, which because this is a phone system and because it has to work, this is very important. Uh, the biggest thing we put into Asterisk this year is a new HD uh, media engine. Now, Asterisk started out in 1999, and that was in the age of sort of telephony-grade audio. Everything was, if you're uh, familiar with the, the sort of technicalities of it, 8 kilohertz audio that uh, really worked fairly well, considering it was on telephone lines, some of which were 100 years old at that point, but it wasn't exactly the future. We also had a limitation of the number of codecs that we were able to add and how we were able to configure those codecs. 
So things that we had to overcome this year were fairly serious. These were really integral, inter, integral parts of the core of asterisk. So we went through and we replaced the media engine, which had been built for uh, low-level telephony audio, with modern high-definition audio. We added a lot more codecs. We put in the ability to configure codecs much more complex than just the basic yes, we have it or no, we don't uh, support we had previously. And we've added every sampling rate under the sun. So you're now able to uh, transfer an entire symphony from one side of the world to the other using asterisk if you want to in perfect uh, fidelity. So the new codecs that we've added. Well, uh, we've added the ultra wideband version of the Speaks codec. Now, Speaks has been in asterisk for a long time, but we decided that uh, as part of the upgrade, we would go ahead and add in the ability to do ultra wideband then. So it will go up to, I believe, 32 kilohertz, or at least that's what we're able to demonstrate. We also added in uh, Skype's super wideband silk codec, which is a great codec for trunking, and slowly you're starting to see a few clients start uh, implementing this as well. We also added passive support for the Kelt codecs, which are very low latency codecs, which are frequently used for extremely high definition audio and for broadcast media. And we've also added on, uh, or built add-on modules for Polycom's Siren 7 and Siren 14 high definition codecs as well. So, we've got this fancy new media engine. Um, I'd like to kind of show that to you. So, what I'm going to do next is a, uh, a demo of HD calling with asterisk. And now, this is a live demo. Live demos are always fraught with danger. There's always the possibility that something will just fail completely. So please, have mercy on it. demonstrate what old-fashioned 8 kilohertz audio sounded like. So I'm going to place a call using the traditional telephony of the 70s, 80s, 90s. And uh, here, you'll hear it today. down there that's acting as the server. We're talking across the network. It's playing out through the soft phone on my machine, and we're presenting it through the, uh, the speakers here. Let me take it up a notch and take it to uh, G722, which is really the, uh, the current standard for telephony high definition. And we'll take a listen to how that sounds. Okay. Can you notice the uh, difference there? How much more of the uh, treble you get from the base G722? How much clearer it sounds? That's pretty good. We can actually go a couple of steps better. So let me take it over to uh, 24 kilohertz silk. Now, silk is a great codec because you can actually configure it to a number of different ways. You can actually set it up uh, to be a very, very um, rich codec that will carry you know, a great deal of audio information. And so you get really high definition performance. But you can also turn it around and crank it in the other direction so that it uses only 8 kilohertz of audio, or pardon me, of bandwidth on the wire, uh, making it really the same basic uh, bit rate as G729. You know what the difference is? It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to pay for G729 licenses. Uh, everybody has for that one except the guys who hold G729 patents. And, oh well, I think they've done okay with themselves so far. So here is Silk in 24 kilohertz. So let's take it one last notch, and I'll do this quickly. Uh, give Malcolm just a moment here. But the next thing we're going to do is actually uh, 32 kilohertz speaks. Now, speaks was originally created to be just a uh, spoken language codec. It really was focused on being a free implementation of a codec that was great for doing low bandwidth voice. But as part of the uh, sort of evolution of everything, it's moved into the HD audio world as well. And so let's take a listen to 32 kilohertz speaks as well. Okay, uh, I'll tell you, uh, 
uh, I listened to that track on the original CD when we ripped it to set it up for this demonstration, and then I listened to it on Speaks 32, and I'll tell you, I could not tell the difference other than the fact that it's mono on this and it's stereo when you hear it coming through from the uh, CD. So please don't tell Mr. Van Halen I borrowed his music for this. <laughs> okay, so that was uh, HD Rolling. And, uh, and oh, I suppose I should say thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the next thing I want to talk about is HD conferencing. Because while well, setting up a single party to single party call is great, being able to actually take a giant conference call where you have 10, 100, several hundred people all wrapped together in one call is even better. Uh, conference calls are a more complex environment than a regular phone call. You have lots more audio data coming in and you have a lot harder time following it, especially if it's using good old telephony grade 8 kilohertz audio. So we decided that the best way we could show off the new media engine was to actually update the ConfBridge application to support all the new media features we've added, including all these new sampling rates. And uh, at the same time, we decided to make it much more configurable than the previous version of ConfBridge or its uh, predecessor, the Meetme application. So you can now actually configure ConfBridge however you like. Uh, you can set up your own DTMF menus, and you can even assign your own tones for joining a conference, leaving a conference, having somebody booted out of a conference, etc. So uh, the good thing about this, there are other things out there that do HD uh, audio conferencing, but for the most part, those are set up so that as long as everybody is HD, the conference remains HD. But if you have somebody who joins that is using standard definition audio, 8 kilohertz audio, the entire bridge gets downgraded so that you're listening to 8 kilohertz audio. We decided that that just wasn't the way of the future. So the conf bridge conference is now set up so that as long as there are two parties in the system which are speaking, which are providing HD audio, uh, the whole bridge remains at high definition and it will only downsample for those people that are dialed in over traditional telephony connections. So it will remain high def. Now to kind of demonstrate this, we'll actually do another demo for HD conferencing. So bring my uh, back up here. And at this point, we're going to do two of these. I'm going to set up an 8 kilohertz conference so you can hear what traditional telephony conferencing sounds like. And so I'm going to uh, place a call into the bridge, and Malcolm will place a call into the bridge. Uh, uh, for example, silk, or if you wanted to take that even to 32 kilohertz, 
Now, I will say that we're not demonstrating that because we're running on a tiny laptop that has an atom processor and about, uh, I think, one gig of RAM. So it's not exactly the optimal thing for doing really great high definition audio conferencing. But uh, people say, so what's a great use case for this? Uh, one of the best things that we've been able to talk about is broadcast media. People in the broadcast industry for years have had to lease an ISDN line to places where they're doing remote connections. With this, you're actually able to set up an asterisk system and go IP. And most business locations where you'd be doing the remote will already have a pretty good internet connection. No need to lease a line, no need to set things up weeks in advance, no need to roll out a truck with one of those giant antennas and be able to get line of sight back in the studio. Just set up an asterisk system, get a really good soft client and a great microphone, and you can do remotes. So, back to the features of asterisk. So we decided that uh, you know, HD conferencing was pretty cool. If audio conferencing is cool, what's even cooler? Well, I would say video conferencing would be even cooler. So, while the uh, engineers that were working on this had asterisk torn apart, they said, how hard would it be for us to take ConfBridge and add in the ability to do basic video conferencing? So what we've got right now is a version of ConfBridge that actually supports a single party representation uh, video conferencing. Everyone who wants to participate sends their video streams into Asterisk, and Asterisk sends out to all of the participants only one video stream. It's not the, uh, the, the Brady Bunch talking head style of conferencing. It's a little bit simpler, but it's very effective. Um, so in order to pick who's the current, uh, who is the person whose video is being relayed, uh, we can either mark somebody as the moderator or the leader or something when they enter. So if you're doing training, that's what works. Uh, if it's something where you've got a bunch of people, all of whom are sort of peers of each other, you do uh, voice activity detection, and the current speaker is the person whose video gets relayed. You can also set it up so somebody could act as the administrator and control it through DTMF tones. Um, the limitation to this is that right now everybody has to be using the same codec because we aren't able to actually transcode in real time between one video codec and another. That's a very computationally expensive operation. Uh, and it's not something that we have the DSP expertise to do in-house. Now, what we are hoping is that there are some people out there who are DSP engineers who go, oh, this sounds like a fun open source project. I'd love to contribute some code to do that. So if any of you happen to be in the, uh, the video DSP industry, please come talk to me after this presentation. So now, I'm going to take uh, my life in my hands again, and we're going to do a video conference. So I'm going to give Malcolm one moment to get the video conference prepared. And let me bring uh, my client back over here. All right. And are we ready? Okay, I'm going to dial in. One, five, one, six. Here. I'm going to go to video. And so, here we see. Hi, video. Yeah, that looks like somebody else is joining the call. And who would that be? Okay, hey look, it's Malcolm. There he is. He must have spoken last because he's the current person being displayed. What if we got a third person to dial in? Maybe from something like a mobile device. Oh, here's David Duffett with a mobile device. David! <coughs> so managed to dial 516 and... <laughs> Ah, there we see David. He's got a very low bandwidth uh, connection off of that phone, and so he's only sending in uh, SIF. I think it's uh, what, a quarter of VGA or less. So, there we see David. But uh, you know, uh, it's actually showing that you're able to do uh, connections between different devices using different clients, all using the same conflict application that we were demonstrating a minute ago. Or, by the way, the audio on this is G722 at 16 kilohertz. So again, great audio to go along with great video. All in an open source project. So thank you very much, David. Okay, so let me uh, step back into the main presentation here. Okay, here we go. So what else have we put in? Well, after doing the excitement of video conferencing, I thought there was only one thing that could be more exciting, and that's facts. <laughs> okay, maybe not. But we did make some significant improvements to facts. 
uh, we added T38 gateway support. So previously, Asterisk has been able to do T38 internet faxing, SIP faxing, and we've been able to do analog faxing. But those always had to be done on separate segments. If you had a T38 service provider sending you a fax and you wanted it delivered to your analog fax machine, the call had to come in, be turned into a TIFF file, and then the dial plan would kick off another call that would go to the fax machine, which would then play out that TIFF file to the fax machine and it would actually be printed there. That's great, but it isn't exactly what people want. The people who are using fax for the most part are people like doctors and lawyers and cavemen. And so, <laughs> but they need it for legal purposes to be able to know that the fax was sent from one place and received at the other place. They need delivery confirmation. And so, in order to make that happen, you had to be able to make the call, all one call, all the way through. And that's what T38 Gateway Support offers. Better billing confirmation, better delivery confirmation. Um, fax still sucks and should go away, but we're now able to do it. And it is something that's important for the, uh, the PBX world, so something we hope to see flowing into the last experience in. Uh, I guess the last major feature that I'll talk about is text messaging. Uh, Asterisk has previously had some basic support to send and receive text messages using the XMPP or Jabber protocol. Uh, we also have limited support for the uh, SIP message function or, or capability, but those were always in the context of an active call. You had to actually have a voice call and a full session set up in order to send a text message through, and that's totally inefficient for the way text messaging needs to work. So, with this version of Asterisk, we've actually added the ability to route text messages outside the context of a call using a number of dial plan functions and applications. Uh, what this gives you the ability to build, ultimately, would be a multi-protocol text router based on Asterisk. So you can have messages come in from a SIP simple enabled client, something like uh, XLite or Bria, and then route that out to a, uh, a Pigeon client on XMPP. You can also use it for a lot of interesting machine-to-machine -machine communication and command and control functions. Things that you previously probably had to do uh, with the Asterisk Manager, you might be able to do in interesting ways with XMPP or SIP message. So we're hoping to see somebody jump in and turn Asterisk into a real world-class text messaging server now that we've got the, uh, the necessary plumbing in place. So we would have done Skype, but the Skype guys kind of pulled the plug on the whole Skype for Asterisk thing. So, Anyway, maybe next year. <laughs> One last thing that I wanted to mention is that in past years, people have said, hey, there's a lot of stuff in Asterisk that's great, but there's also some stuff that hasn't been maintained very well, is old, is kind of crufty, is the, uh, the computer nerd term you hear used a lot. Uh, is there some way to mark things that are less supported or are you know, not going to be around in, say, future versions of Asterisk? <laughs> so we've actually built in um, module level deprecation into Asterisk 10. So you'll now be able to go in, and by default, it only builds the currently supported modules. If you need to use a module that's deprecated, you can go in and turn them on, and it will show you in this interface what has been deprecated, what hasn't, and of course, if it's deprecated, it will theoretically show you what you're supposed to use in place of the old module. So uh, we've got a number of other smaller features. Um, for the computer, or probably for the programmers out there, uh, we've actually replaced the underlying AskDB, which was based on uh, Berkeley DB, which was then bought by somebody, somebody I think Oracle owns it now. So um, it's actually been replaced with SQLite 3. We did this because there were some bugs in the implementation of Berkeley DB that we had. The next version had a different license that wasn't compatible with Asterisk. And uh, SQLite 3 just rocks. Everybody uses it. Uh, Apple makes extensive use of it. Uh, Google makes extensive use of it. It's very stable, and the license is actually uh, totally open source. It's uh, public domain. So we've built a utility into Asterisk 10. So if you do an upgrade, it will actually look for your old uh, Berkeley DB database and will convert it into a new SQLite 3 database. If you have any reason to have to go backwards, if you're going to go back down to an older version of Asterisk, there's another utility that lets you roll back. Uh, in order to do this, you will need to have the SQLite 3 library that's available for every distribution in the, uh, the universe installed on your machine. So, uh, we've also added IPv6 support for the onboard HTTP server. So if you're using HTTP for manager, or if you're actually making use of it just to serve static files you know, related to uh, some subsection of the UI, and you're actually able to um, 
I approached that via IPv6. Uh, the Lua routing engine now supports hints, so it's been upgrading. You'll find that the rest of Astros behaves more or less exactly as it behaved before. So the port, should you choose to go from 1.8 to 1.10 on your uh, bleeding edge version, will, uh, will be fairly painless, I'll say. I, I can never guarantee that it will be 100% perfect, but we've been striving over the last few years to make it better and better for the developers that are using Asterisk. So, Asterisk 10 and Elastics. Some of the cool things that we really hope to see coming along soon would be HD drawing. Um, right now, you know, you still have to deal with the PSTN and it's still 8 kilohertz, but more and more SID providers are going, okay, we'll at least relay your high definition audio uh, as far as we can, so that you get as good a quality as you can get all the way out to the edge. And in many cases, if you're doing trunking between devices, between one elastic system and another, you'd be able to have high definition audio blowing all the way through. Um, of course, the new conferencing module is in there, and we would love to see somebody take that and turn it into, of course, HD audio conferencing, but also if you want to wrap it up and make use of the video conferencing. Uh, we've put in good manager events for command and control of it. Um, we've documented it pretty well, so take a look at the wiki pages for that. We would love to see that in there. And of course, fax support. I make fun of fax, but it is something that every PBX has to have still. So we hope that, that will help you guys build uh, for the future. And XMPP and zip symbol, um, between the XMPP uh, device date, the information we put in last year, and now the full on messaging support that we've got in this year, we're really hoping to see you guys be able to do things like build uh, you know, clustered systems very easily and to be able to, uh, to mix media together so you can actually provide real unified communication solutions where you've got fax and you've got text and you've got voice and you've got video all coming from this one wonderful product. So I'll take a couple of minutes and ask, are there any asterisk 11 requests out there? Has anybody got something that they would like to see improved, like to see added, removed, etc.? So I just saw one hand go up. Voy a hacer la pregunta en español, si ya se me la traducción, por favor. Eh, en, a ver, sí. En la mañana... Can I have a translator for that? I'm sorry. Sí. Sí, por favor. ¿Puedes traducir tu pregunta? ¿Puedes repetirla, por favor? Sí, sí. En la mañana hay un progresista, no fue muy específico, pero me mencionó que la vida de las personas humanas me parecen concurrentes, pero ya se les que empezaron a tener algunos problemas. No sé si tengas alguna información al respecto. Ok, él ha mencionado un par de presentaciones que me voy a hacer. Alguien ha mencionado que cuando Asterix tiene más de 200 concurrentes, puede tener algún tipo de problemas. We want to know what, 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 uh, what is the cause of that, what happened, or is this true with it? Okay. I'm not specifically aware of any limitation or anything that would intentionally happen in 200 concurrent calls. I will say that the way Astros behaves on any one particular box depends on a lot of different factors. First of all, the hardware that you're using, uh, the number of CPU cores, because it's very uh, massively multi-threaded. So the more cores you have, the better it will behave across uh, on any one system. Also, it depends on what you're doing with it. Are your calls being transcoded? Are your calls being converted uh, in any way? Are they being recorded? <laughs> Recording takes a lot of uh, I.O. capability. Transcoding takes a lot of CPU capability. Uh, we've had some people running Astros systems that have handled upwards into the uh, below thousands of calls on any one box. Um, so I'm surprised if you're experiencing problems at 200. It may be that there's something either in the, uh, the implementation of the asterisk that you have, or there's some, simply some function that you're, you're making use of, which uh, is very expensive, and you may need to up the hardware that you're, you're using. I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards, if I can find a translator to help you. <laughs> Any other suggestions, thoughts? <laughs> You are not saying that you will support video conferencing. Would you support uh, the S264 SVC protocol or color? Is 
the is a very correct for the video. SVC as opposed to H.264 ABC. Uh, H.264 SVC is interesting in that it's a really weird codec that allows you to stream out one sort of uh, meta package of data which includes a number of underlying different resolutions and your in-device, whatever it is, simply uh, subscribes to whatever it actually supports. Uh, so if it's a very low-end device, it's only going to, you know, maybe display QSIP or SIP or something like that. And if it's a high-end device, then you're going to get, you know, 720p or something really fantastic. So the video conferencing support that's in Asterisk right now is not dependent upon codecs except for negotiation because Asterisk isn't manipulating the codecs. It's not translating, it's not uh, resizing, it's not decoding, it's not doing any of those things. Uh, you know, as Steve mentioned, some of those things are incredibly uh, CPU intensive. Um, you know, in many cases there are also patents involved, uh, so that's you know, not necessarily compatible with GPL. Um, so if you really wanted to have H.264 SVC endpoints uh, making a comp bridge call with Asterisk and doing the video conferencing support that's in there today, uh, you would just need to tweak uh, the uh, invitation capabilities of the SIP channel driver to support SVC as opposed to ABC. I think the SDP type for SVC is just a little bit different than ABC. So right now, ABC uh, flows right through, but I don't think SVC does unless you want to make some modifications. But it shouldn't be done that. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. We've got a number of other questions. It looks like we've got about how much time we have left. So, okay, one more. So, you guys pick somebody. You have their hand up a moment ago? Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, as with uh, one company, it has a long term uh, support, right? Three mm -hmm. years. And then I say that after it's then have just one year of Can I ask you why it's one year? Absolutely. Well, we only make long term support releases on an, an occasional basis because we really need to give people a place where they can jump in and start using Astros in, in very important mission critical applications, PBX systems, web families, etc. On the other hand, we also have an obligation to continue to add new features and new functions. And so when we do a short-term release or a standard release like this, what we're really doing is providing these features for those who are willing to sort of live on the bleeding edge of it uh, and try to and take advantage of them. These will ultimately flow into a long-term support release. And I think uh, Kevin Fleming, who's our Director of Software Technologies, and then who's currently the, uh, the project leader for Astros, his plan is that in 2011, once these have been sort of cooked for a year, uh, they'll actually flow into, a, pardon me, 2012, they'll actually flow into uh, a new long-term support release. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly how it will play out. It's always kind of a, a matter of what the community wants. Um, but we sort of need to have these years uh, that sort of punctuate long-term support releases just to kind of make sure that what we put in is what the community wants, that it works the way it's supposed to. Because we're able to test asterisks, and we spend a lot of time doing it, but nothing actually drives out in all of the bugs by like putting it out as a formal release and letting the rest of the world play with it. So, okay, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. And uh, appreciate it.